actually yes. Um, Today we we come to the end. We've come to the end. We are coming to the end of a wonderful series. series. Everyone say ah. <laughs> What's the name of the series? Is it up on the screen? What's the name of the series? Life Bella Regrets. Life Bella Regrets and we've been going through it we've, we've gone through different tools uh this past month. Actually, I want to figure out do you know what we did in week 1? Anyone remember week 1? What we said one, in week 1? Who one? remembers? Uh, to train secretly you win publicly. No, that's not it. <laughs> what is it? To to win the publicly. Actual, the action was this. Train secret. Week 2 what are you saying week 2? Everyone is looking at the screen, like put it up on the screen, put it up on, it's not coming up on the screen. It's time to get connected. And last week, we, social network, and what did we say? Who's your? Who is your Jethro? Today we bring that series to a close mm -hmm. at the Saturday service, uh, and we love to welcome. Man of God who's been taking us through this series, our senior pastor, our very own, much love. Give it up for Pastor Moravi Wanjao. Oh, Come on, Mabuno, let's give it up for Pastor Moravi as he comes up. Thank you. Oh, it's great to see you this evening, Mavuno. How are you doing? Oh, you really feel like you're doing awesome. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's been an amazingly busy weekend here at Mavuno Church. We just had a Mizizi retreat that I hear was incredible. Anybody who was out there? And we can't wait to graduate these guys. I know they just, they've been an amazing class. All the stories, all the indications are there are some serious, fearless influencers. That I've just graduated from is easy. So we're going to be, they're going to be graduating, I think, next week or the week after. But we're looking forward to just seeing you guys. We also had a life group leaders training today. And so we had life group leaders from all over the place. Uh, let's just appreciate our life group leaders. We've got some amazing leaders, dedicated, focused, commit, committed. And they lead our different life groups here at Mavuno Church. And we, we love our life group leaders. We always say at Mavuno Church, those are the real pastors of Mavuno. And so I'm so, I'm so grateful to see so many of them who took their Saturday to come out here and be with us. Uh, we also had a Teens Connect training which was going on and we have some incredible teens leaders here at Mavuno Church. And uh, amazingly focused, very passionate uh, teens team. Are there any teens leaders in the house today? Anybody from Teens Connect? Uh, no, they're not here. Oh, there's some people at the back. Come on, let's appreciate the Teens Connect leaders as well. Uh, we just have some amazing, just incredible, very gifted, but very passionate as well. So it's been a really good week. And as Pastor Courier said, we've also had some great vision nights. And my goodness, that's, 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 they're so interesting because we get to connect and we get to hear what people are thinking and we get on the same mind regarding what God is calling us in the future of Mavuno. If you consider this your church, if you consider this a part of your future, then I want to challenge you over the next week. Uh, if you can come on Tuesday here or Thursday at All Saints, we'd love to see you. Uh, so please come by if you can. And we're just going to interact and engage on the vision of Mavuno. And I share my heart and then get to hear your heart as well as we go through this process. I'm going to introduce a couple of very special friends uh, who are visiting us all the way from in Africa, we say overseas, abroad. Uh, these are friends from Mariner's Church. We have two pastors who've been visiting, uh, Pastor Kevin and Pastor Caleb. And uh, Pastor Kevin is in charge of their church planting program uh, out at Mariner's Church. So he's, he's actually outreach very much like what Pastor Kama does here, expansion. And then Pastor Caleb is one of the campus pastors. They also have church plants in their city. And he's one of the pastors. And they've been here the whole week. They've spent time with our guys, ch exchanging ideas, connecting, learning together. And we're just making some great learnings together as we connect as churches. So let's just appreciate these two brothers. We're so glad. They're first time ever in Mavuno Church. And we're really glad that you guys are here. Um, well, I want to bring this series to conclusion. Anybody finding their way? Anybody learning how to make decisions? This, this, is, this, this has been an amazing series for me, personally, just to see the lights come on for many people, and for myself as well. Because, you know, when you teach God's Word, God teaches you in the process. And I don't always teach things because I'm perfectly doing them very well in my own life. Sometimes I teach them because God wants me to learn them in the process. And I've had some big decisions that I've been making this month. And the tools we're learning have been refreshed in my mind. And they've been very, very helpful for me to, to, to engage back in. And so I've been blessed. I don't know how many people have been blessed here as well, as God has been speaking to us as about life below regrets. I believe that God is setting us up for life without regrets. Now I want to start with a question. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where your faith collided with your reality? 
So you have faith and you're believing in, no, you're not believing, you're believing in the Lord. You have so much faith and then pew, smack into reality. Anybody ever had a situation like that? And reality is here and faith is here and they're not seeing eye to eye. Well, I had an experience like that once and uh, it was one of the biggest decisions I've ever been part of making. I worked in a church then called Nairobi Chapel and we uh, had outgrown our facility remarkably. I mean, we were, st we were just full to the, to the brim. And the leaders, as we prayed, we began to feel, you know, God wants us to, we, he, he's calling us to uh, trust God and get a piece of land that can allow us to really multiply uh, and grow the church. And it was an exciting time. I mean, we prayed about it. We felt, yeah, this is obviously the next step. We shared it with the congregation. Everybody was excited about it. And it was, it was, it was something that everybody was happy about. So anyway, we got into the process. We had never done this before. It turned out to be extremely exhausting. Uh, we did everything you can think about to raise money those days. Uh, we, I remember we had a bake sale. I remember the teens were washing cars. I mean, they were extortioning us for money because what would happen, you'd find your car uh, washed and a note saying you owe me 500 shillings for washing your car. And then at the bottom it's written, it's for the relocation, so please pay. Uh, and I mean, guys did all kinds of things to raise money. I mean, we walked. I remember the hardest thing I've ever done in my life was walking from Naivasha to Nairobi. I mean, we walked, and we're like, I think there was probably a hundred of us from the church who did that walk. And we, I mean, it, our shoes wore, I mean, it was just blisters being cut. Anyway, that was the hardest thing. Let me tell you, you've never done, you're not, you're not man enough until you've done that walk, guys. You've got to do that walk one in your, once in your life. It was something else. I will, I will never do it again. Let me just say that. So don't, don't quote me. It's a, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. After that, we climbed the mountain. I mean, it was so ex excruciating. We, the kids... Uh, walked from Nairobi to Thika, the children's ministry. And then the teens took over from Thika to Mount Kenya. <laughs> I'm we were crazy. Uh, then the, the women of the church climbed to Point Lenana. Any fearless ladies in the house? And then, <laughs> and then the dudes climbed to Point Lenana as well. <laughs> yeah. And then some fearless influencers, about six uh, really tough people, including our senior pastor at the time, climbed to Point Bashian, which is the highest point in Kenya. They had to use ropes and masks and oxygen and all that stuff. I mean, it was excruciating to raise this money. But you know what? By God's grace, <laughs> the day before the money was due, it was like we were all praying, we had given to, we couldn't, I mean, it was just, <gasps> and we, we were, I mean, it was like we needed a miracle, we were praying for a miracle, and the night before, an amount came in and we had everything we needed. I mean, you can imagine the service when we were celebrating on the land. We were dancing. I mean, people were crying. We had 3,000 people on the land. We had one big tent. It was just incredible. And the the, we began the process now of uh, getting the place ready so we could move. And then the NAC government came into place, 2002. One of the first things they did is they froze all the development anywhere near a forest, including the piece of land we had bought. And we got a note from the forestry department saying there are investigations because there's a lot of irregularities in the last government. And we don't want you developing on that land until we say you can, by order of the government. And I remember the shock in the congregation. What? How? And I remember, of course, we were like, God, our God is good though. He can do this thing. And we prayed and nothing happened. And for the next three years, we couldn't take possession of this land that we had worked so hard to possess. I remember the pile of disappointment that descended. I mean, people looked completely flabbergasted by this. I remember one person asking me, Pastor, did you pray? Like, did you hear God? Was this just something where you guys were leading us blind? What were you guys thinking? And what do you tell a person at that point? I had no words. It was so disappointing. My faith, pop, smack into reality. Ever been in a situation where your, your faith smacked into reality and they were saying two different things? You know, I've talked to people and there's some people here who say they wanted to enter a certain profession. Some of my friends, as, as I asked this question, uh, wanted to enter a certain profession and they trusted and believed God was calling them to enter this profession. Did the series of exams and pew, they failed. Professional qualifications. Couldn't get in. It was so expensive. They used all their money to do the exam and then they failed it. Some other people told me, uh, somebody else told me that he felt certain God wanted him to apply for a certain job. And he put in all the, the due diligence to get into the job. He was so prayed up. Everybody knew he was getting it because God had told him. And then guess what? Somebody more connected got the job and not him. 
And he was so disappointed. His faith smacked into reality. Somebody else told me they felt God wanted them to mend their marriage. And, the more, but, but, and, and they left church with a lot of excitement. I'm going to mend my marriage. God really wants this thing to turn around. It's possible. But what they found out is, to their surprise, the more they began to reach out to their spouse and to act differently, hoping to win them, the colder and more distant their spouse beca- became. And eventually, their marriage did not survive. Faith smacking into reality. And it's not always the bad situations that we're talking about. Because sometimes, faith smacks into reality with positive situations that are still not what you were thinking. Perhaps you wanted to quit your job and start a ministry. Somebody told me this was their situation. Wanted to quit their job and start a ministry. And the minute they came, the, the, the month they came, thinking it was their last month at work, they found a pay rise three times of what they'd been earning. God... You are saying, what's going on here? It wasn't connecting. Another person uh, said that (laughs) they were praying for a job to support his wife and his children and really trusting God to do it. And finally, one job came through. And he was so excited until he realized that the demand for this job, the one condition was that he would have to work abroad and they do not want his family with him. And so he was going to have to say goodbye to them and be apart from them so he could support them. And he's thinking, okay, it's good news, but it's not what God was calling me to. What is this? What happens when your faith runs smack into reality? For our visitors, we've been going through a series called Life Builder Regrets. Uh, Just to bring you up to speed, we've been talking about the the navigation tools that we need uh, because life, (laughs) the decisions we're making today in life, the life-altering decisions, they lead us in completely different directions. We've said that, you know, when you're kids, your decisions meant very little. They didn't really affect where your life went, uh, ended up. But today, the decisions we're making are deciding where we're going to be in the future. And some of us are making decisions today that will determine that we will end up a fruit, living a fruitful life. And others are making decisions today that will determine that we live a life of regrets. And we're learning from God's Word how to enter into the tools that help us to live life below regrets. So we began by looking at the first, the first uh, week by saying God's Word is our instructor. It's our personal trainer. It's what gives us the mindset that helps us begin to know the way that we must go. Pastor Kui, I left my Bible with you. I can't preach without it. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, this is God's Word. <laughs> so, in case you, did, you figured, yeah, I can't, I can't preach without this. And this is what helps us begin to de- decide the direction that we're going. We talked about prayer is our GPS. And we say that, you know what, prayer is what, once we know the direction from God's Word, it's what keeps us connected. It's what helps us uh, step by step to figure out how to turn in, uh, in the de- decisions that we need to make. And then last week we say that godly advisors are our social network. They guide us along the way. They speak the truth in love to us to make sure that we don't leave the way once we're in it. Now today we want to look at the last tool. And I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to Judges chapter 6, verse 36 to 40. Judges 6, verse 36 to 40. This is a tool, by the way, that many of us have used, use. Uh, it's, very, it's a very popular tool. You just didn't know that it was a tool that you use for decision making. Judges chapter 6, six verse 36 to 40. And as you turn there, I'm going to pray for us. As is our custom, we're going to just ask God to speak to us as we listen to his word. His word is so important. This is such an important moment for us because his word instructs us. And we want to be in that place where he can speak to us. So if you are there, let me just pray for us as we begin. Father, I thank you. Thank you so much for this evening. Thank you for every single person gathered here tonight. Thank you that none of us is here by coincidence, that, Lord, you have determined it. Indeed, your word says that, Lord, you you who knows the beginning from the end, that, Father God, there are no coincidences with you. All things are working out for our good, and we're here for our purpose. And so I know that nobody is here by coincidence. I know that nobody is here because they they just happened to be here. But you've drawn us here by your Spirit. And so, Lord, I speak now that your purpose would prevail in this place. Lord, I submit myself to you, and I pray that, Lord, you would use me as a vessel for your word. I pray that you would speak to every single one of us through this word, including myself. Lord, I pray that you would not pass anyone by. And as we have done in the past, we will do again. In the name of Jesus, we come against any spirit, any divisive spirit, anything that would keep 
your people from hearing your word. We take authority over it and we bind it and cast it from this place. And I speak clear heavens, Lord. I speak that, Lord, every single person here would be riveted by your word. And that, Lord, all of us under your word will be transformed into the image of Jesus himself. I pray that, Lord, you transform us through this message so our lives would never be the same. And, Lord, we ask this in your precious and holy name. God's people say it. Amen. Verse 36, Judges chapter 6. And it says, Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is any dew, on the, if, if there is dew only on the fleece, and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. And that is what happened. Gideon rose the next, uh, early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, don't be angry with me. Let me just make one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece. This time, make the fleece dry and the ground covered with dew. That night, God did so. Only the fleece was dry. All the ground was covered with dew. You know, God had appeared to Gideon and had clearly commanded him, told him, listen, I want you, mighty warrior, I want you to lead Israel out of bondage. At that time, the Midianites were the, the colonizing power. Now, this force that had come, taken over their land, taken over their means of production, these people were oppressed, they were hiding, they, were, they couldn't even, they had no means of production, they had no food anymore because their enemy was in the house. I mean, they had taken over everything. And they're in, in that place of hiding, this very fearful man, an angel appears to him and says, God is with you, mighty warrior. And he's shocked. And then God tells him, you're the one I will use to deliver Israel from the hand of the Midianites. At that point, uh, Gideon entered a series of actions, uh, a series of events that he had not anticipated. Uh, first thing happened is that God challenged him to go into his house and break up all the altars there. And then God led him into the, the, the battlefield and he called Israel to him. Gideon says, you know, God, I, I, I thought I heard you, but I want to make sure that we're on the same page. And he says, prove to me that you're the one who sent me. I want a wet fleece, dry ground. So there's a, there's a, 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 a sheep fleece, uh, probably something that was used as a carpet outside his door. And he says, in the morning when I wake up, I want the ground to be bone dry. And I want this thing to be wet. And I'll know. So he goes to sleep. I mean, that's like, gosh, if that thing is wet, it has to be God. So he wakes up the next morning and he can't, he's just like, okay, did that thing really happen? And he goes and picks it up and shoo, a whole bowl of water. And he's like, maybe someone had me praying. What if some guys came and poured water here? What if one of the soldiers actually peed outside my tent? Ooh. Okay, that's not a good thought. Okay, it's not in the Bible. But, but it, it can be explained. Something could have happened. Maybe a bowl of water, someone was drinking it poured. They said, okay, hold on, hold on, God. This is not good. It's good, but it's not good enough. Let's try something else. Something that can't be faked. I want all the ground to be wet and this fleece to be dry. How's that? It's like that one. Surely, it's not going to happen. Goes to sleep, and the next morning, guess what? Exactly what he asks for has happened. You know, it's very common today for Christians to look for circumstances that will determine how we act, the direction that we will go. This is one of our most common decision-making tools. We do it all the time. In fact, as Christians, we even have a name for it. Uh, when the circumstances are favorable towards the course of action we're thinking, we call that an open door. Praise God. Hallelujah. A door open before me. Uh, when, it do when the circumstances are against what we want to do, we say that's a closed door. Let me describe these for those of you who haven't been in this Christian thing for a long time. I'll help you understand the lingo here. Open doors are opportunities that favor your course of action. For example, you meet someone, you're at a party, and someone offers you a job, a new job. Just somebody you met randomly. And it's going to pay you three times what you asked for. What? Hallelujah. Calculate that right now. Three times your, your, your pay right now. Anybody seeing it? Praise God. I mean, this has to be from God. And, or, or, or maybe you're just minding your business and then you get a letter from the mail and it says you've just won a green card. 
and you can go, or some immigration thing to some rich Western country, and you're like, oh my goodness, my problems are over. You just want it. You aren't looking for it. Or maybe you're thinking, you're just thinking about getting a new car, and you get into the office, and the boss says, your bonus is due. And it's exactly the same amount, within a few hundred shillings, of the car you've been thinking of buying. Open door. And you know what happens when Christians, when that happens, they come to church and they say, the doors have opened. The Lord has seen me. This is exactly what an open door is. Uh, in fact, many times, uh, this, uh, for, for, for Christians, uh, this, this, this lingo of the door open, it's obvious at that point that God must be the one who opened it. We always think that as Christians. Closed doors. These are challenges that seem to block the course of action that we were determined to take. For example, you're planning to support a poor child, and then you lose your job. And that's confusing, isn't it? I mean, God, I was planning to support somebody poor, and then how do I lose my job? Clearly, you can't want me to do this. Or, just as you're about to start your business, the economy goes south, and the shilling goes south as well. And you find yourself in a, in a, in a dilemma. What does this mean? Is this God asking me not to do this? Or you're on your way to an interview... And then it rains. The one day it's rained the whole week. And you look at the sky and you're like, this must be a sign. That job is from the devil himself. I mean, don't we think like this sometimes? It's like, I mean, the sign. It happened. There was a sign, a clear sign that told me that this thing wasn't for me. Many times when the door closes, most of us tend to conclude that this is not what God wanted. This was not his will. Clearly, he was against this course of action right from the start. Now, there are several dangers to depending on circumstances to determine our course of action. I'm going to tell you a few of them uh, that, I, uh, that I can see. The first is determining on circumstances, determining on watching the, watching the doors. Let's call it watching the doors. Watching the doors can destroy destiny. It can destroy destiny. You see, just because an opportunity has opened up doesn't mean it's God's will for you. Did you know the devil also opens doors? <laughs> he does. He does. In fact, there's 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. It says, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Satan doesn't just come and tell you, I'm the devil. Do this for me. <laughs> Duh. He doesn't do that. That's only in the movies, Hollywood. I mean, in real life, the devil is the lady in red. Beautiful. Whatever is irresistible. He's irresistible. She's, well, whatever. I don't think the devil has a gender, by the way. I think the Bible just uses genders because it has to. Uh, she wears Prada. The devil wears Prada. Actually, that's right. She, Hollywood told us that, yeah. So, so, so Satan comes and opens doors for you. And you know, that's exactly what happened to Jesus, isn't it? That when he's in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, Satan is trying to throw all kinds of doors open in his life. Look, turn, turn, turn this stuff into the stones, into bread. Make a sign. You'll be so popular. Throw yourself down. Show a miraculous sign. People will, be so, will believe in you. And he's, he's, he's opening all kinds of doors. But Jesus knows, no, that's not a God door. I'm not walking through that. In fact, he knows if I walk through that, it will destroy the destiny that I came to this earth for. Do you realize that that new job could be the very thing that will destroy your marriage? Christians, I see, I see Christians all the time. Oh, praise God, I've got a new job. Have you asked what the hours of that new job are? Have you asked whether the values in that new job, that workplace, will allow you to support your family? You know, the devil opens doors for new jobs. He gives jobs as well. Do you know that green card could be the thing that takes you completely away from where God wants you to go? Yeah, absolutely. Takes you away from your destiny. Do you know that new car could be the thing that keeps you in financial bondage for the rest of your life? I need to shout at that one, man. I don't like to shout, but you know, listen, listen, listen. So many people come and they say, oh, praise God, God bless me with a car. And you look at that car and the first thing you want to ask is, can you afford that car? Do you know a car needs insurance and fuel and servicing and oil changes? Do you know in the job you never had to pay for any of those costs? Somebody else paid for those costs. But you know, nobody's asking those questions. God opened the door. He gave me a new car. But you're not asking, who opened that door? 
On the other hand, not every closed door is a sign of God's disapproval either. I think it's important for Christians to know this. Just because I'm facing opposition doesn't mean that God is displeased with me. It doesn't even mean that this door will remain closed forever. Sometimes God is just saying, look, I want to work on your patience. I want to work on your character. So wait. It could just be God saying wait. It doesn't have to be a slam. It doesn't have to be a no. God could be saying wait in that process. Or perhaps it's the devil attacking me and God wants me to learn to resist the devil that he can flee from me. That this could just be an opportunity for me to grow in spiritual warfare and understanding my place in Christ. Or perhaps God just wants me to grow in perseverance and endurance through a difficult situation. This is what happened to Paul. He says, I asked God many times to take away this thorn, this thing that was disturbing me. And God says, my grace is sufficient for you. I want you to learn, Paul, how to live with that thing. Many people think it was a health condition. Some people think it was his eyes. And God says, you know what? You, the one who heals people, I will actually not take it away from you. Why? Because I want you to learn to depend on me, Paul. The gifts I've given you would, on most normal people, they'd blow up their heads. They'd become so stuck up. But you, I want you to keep praying. So I'm going to keep you in that situation. Maybe God is saying some, something to some, somebody right now. You've been praying and praying and praying. And God is saying, my grace is sufficient. I want you to discover my grace right now. That's why I'm not opening the door. It's not that I hate you. It's because I know if I open that door right now, it will destroy you. And sometimes a closed door is not a sign that God hates you. It might just be that God wants you to grow in dependence on Him. By giving up, I may be taking the path of least resistance and in the process of moving away from God's purpose for me. I've come to understand something about doors. The devil opens up doors as well. Tell your neighbor, don't just enter because it's open. Think, think. Don't just enter because it's open. Second thing about door watching, it can disguise disobedience. It can disguise disobedience. I mean, Gideon, Gideon, this guy, he knew what God had told him to do. Gideon, he saw the angel. He knew God was telling him to lead these people, but he was afraid. He was afraid. He was like, Lord, you know me. You know my family. Why me? Why, why, why have you chosen me? Why can't you use someone else? God, I'm afraid. Fearless influence. Don't call me a fearless influence. I'm happy to be fearful, an influencer. Just leave me as I am. <laughs> Don't call me that. He doesn't want to be used by God. He's afraid. And these fleeces were merely a method of trying to get God to move somewhere else and use someone else. He's trying to wiggle out of his assignment. You know, many times we ask God to do something before we can obey. Say, God, if you do this, then I'll obey you. I've had people say this. God, I'm so in love with this guy, even though I know he's not saved. He's not a Christian. But Lord, if you want me to leave him, make me stop feeling in love. As you gave me the feelings. So it's your fault. So, so take away the feeling, then I'll, then I'll do it. I, I, ever had somebody say that? I hear some guilty laughter right now. <laughs> oh, if God really wanted me to tithe, then he would pay all my expenses first. I mean, God, I mean, you want me to give. Surely look at how I'm struggling. Surely if you really wanted me to give, tithe must be for other people. Because for me, he hasn't blessed me enough to tithe. And so many times we find ourselves in that situation where we're giving God conditional obedience. Lord, I'll do what you've told me to do if disguising our disobedience. You see, this, I, I hear people say, I'm asking God for a fleece. I'm, sure, I'm asking God for a sign. But you know, let me tell you something about this passage. This is not recommended behavior. The Bible doesn't, not all the stories in the Bible are for you to copy. Some of the stories are telling you what not to do. David slept with somebody else's wife. And it's in the Bible. Are we together? So, so listen. So, so, so don't just do it because it's in the Bible. Learn. What is God saying? This example is an example of a man who lacks faith. A man who lets his fear rule over his faith. By laying down our fleece, by giving God our conditions, we're hoping God will let us off because we don't want to do what he's saying. Tell your neighbor, it's time to stop praying and start obeying. Some, some of us are still in that place where, Lord, just, Lord, show me your will. No, 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 no. You know God's will. You know what he told you to do. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. 
I, I find this one so hard. Because I, I, I meet people all the time. They know exactly what God is saying. But it doesn't fit into their agenda. And so they are looking for a second opinion from the same God. This is Gideon right here. Third thing about watching doors, it can promote deception. And this is scary. It can really promote deception. Have you ever noticed how when you think you're buying a certain car, somehow you see those cars all of a sudden all around Nairobi? Or if you think you're buying a certain model of mobile phone, somehow you start noticing, Allah, guys have this phone. Eh? I mean, it's how, all of a sudden your friends, you're like, Allah, I thought this thing was, everybody has it. You know something, when you're looking for something, you will see it. This is just the way human beings are. When you're looking for something, you'll notice it. And this is the thing that happens to us many times. For example, <laughs> if you've already determined you want to marry a certain person, and in your heart, you've made that decision, you will look for signs that confirm what you've already decided. And when you see signs that don't confirm that, you will ignore those signs and focus on the ones that, oh my goodness, your birthday is the same day as my mother. What? There's a sign. I mean, how? I mean, do you know how, how, what a coincidence that is? It must be God. Hello? Okay, because you guys are laughing like you don't ever do this kind of thing. You know, you don't ever, you don't, you don't ever look for signs to confirm what you're already thinking. This, this is what we do, isn't it? When you want to do something, you look for the signs to confirm what your deceptive heart has already determined is the way you must go. And it's a dangerous tendency. Bible tells us, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? It's talking about your heart. It's saying that heart of yours, it's deceptive above all things. That's a very hard thing to say. It's a bit harsh, huh? The heart is not so smart. It's not. You know, I meet people that tell me, you know, pastor, I've prayed about this. I feel peace. Hey. That heart that is feeling the peace, what does the Bible call it? deceptive above all things. Now, I'm not saying that you can't feel peace and it can't be God's peace. But I'm just saying, don't trust your heart. It can't be the only thing you rely on because it's deceptive. Depending on our circumstances to make decisions can be very dangerous because we can easily fool ourselves into thinking that the decision we're making is God's, but it's actually our own decision in disguise. Don't enter that door just because it's open. Don't enter just because it's open. You know, it's, <laughs> as I think about this, I distrust. It's easy to begin to distrust your heart, distrust your situation. But I believe that situations can actually be valid and God can use them to speak to us. He can use them. And I believe that this is actually our fourth tool. But I say all these things I've said before in caveat because we need to be careful. We must take precautions if we're using circumstances to discern where to go. If God's word is our instructor that shows us the way, and, God's, and prayer is a GPS that keeps us moving in the way, and godly advisors are a social network that encourages us along the way, then our doors or our circumstances can be the landmarks along the way that assure us that we're moving in the right direction. So there's a validity to circumstances. There is. However, based on what we've just seen, we need to take precautions as we look at them, to make sure we don't destroy our destiny. We don't disguise disobedience. We don't promote deception in our lives. So here are some precautions that you must take as you assess the opportunities and the challenges in your life because these doors are both open and closed. Here are some precautions you want to take. The first is never look at circumstances in isolation. Never look at circumstances in isolation. You know, the circumstances in our lives need to agree with the other three navigation tools. They should confirm what they're saying. They shouldn't direct us until they're backed up by God's word, by prayer, and by our social networks. Is it in agreement to God's word? Is there confirmation as I pray that God would give me leading? What do my godly advisors have to say about this course of action? As we assess our opportunities, as we assess our challenges in the light of these tools, then we're able to tell whether God is actually speaking to us 
or if this is merely a distraction. You know, many of us seek for circumstances to speak to us as opposed to seeking for God to speak to us through circumstances. We're looking at the circumstances, and that's superstition, basically. It's not Christianity. You know, if the kinds of things, I mean, God, if I just, if I, if I meet him today dressed in red, he must be the one. I mean, that's superstition. It's not, it's not God. <laughs> God, if I find no traffic on the road, I'll know you want me for, to go to life group today. That laughter is a bit too loud. I'm sure I got somebody there. <laughs> you know, too many of us charge right ahead into those doors. Or we manufacture those circumstances to fit us. And we charge in without taking time to hear what God is saying. There's a great story in the Bible of a man who did this. Joshua. Joshua did that. He looked at circumstances in isolation. They had just taken Jericho, huge city, destroyed it. I mean, it was amazing. It didn't cost them anything. No lives were lost. Uh, they were so victorious. And in the middle of taking the spoils, he looks up the hill. He sees the next city. It's called Ai. I mean, it's like a tiny little thing, even the name Ai. If you're from another part of the country, you'd say Ai. You know? I mean, it's a little tiny, little tiny dot. And he's like, dude, I mean, we marched around and we shouted and this big city fell. Why do we need to go all of us to that place? In fact, we're all tired. Uh, he told his one of his guys, take 3,000 guys, go sort out those guys. Circumstances. They were soundly beaten. Resoundly. I mean, they were thrashed. And people died. And afterwards, now Joshua did what he should have done right from the start. He went on his knees and began to pray, Lord, what should we do? And God told him, you know what? Before you go to Ai, I've got work to do in you. <laughs> you know something? Some of us are just looking at some opportunities and it's like, this is obviously, I must do this. It's so obvious. And God said, ho, ho, hold on a minute. Does it agree? Have you sought me in my word? Have you, have you prayed about it? Have you asked some godly advisor about this course of action? They were soundly defeated. Our circumstances must agree with God's word, his leading through prayer and wisdom of godly advisors. Don't just enter the door because it's open. Number two, don't use circumstances to justify your own way. Never use circumstances to justify what you already want. This was Gideon's problem. He was fearful, didn't want to go to fight, and his intention was simply to find a loophole to keep him from obedience. If God asks you to do the opposite of what you want, will you still obey him? If God asks you to do something that will cost you, that is not what you wanted to hear. Will you still do it? This is a pertinent question. You know, I've come to understand that God doesn't just give his guidance to anybody. We are, we're, we're here talking about making, living a life without regrets. We're talking about becoming, tapping in, connecting to God's guidance. So he guides our feet and he leads us along the way. But God doesn't just entrust his wisdom to anybody. God entrusts his wisdom to those who are committed to obedience. You know, when you pray, Lord, help me. And the Lord says, okay, do this. The commitment then is that you will do it. And you know what happens? As you obey, God gives more wisdom. This is how it works. It's a, it's, a, it's a virtuous cycle. As I obey God in a tricky situation, the next time I ask God for wisdom, He gives it. And the next time He gives it. Have you found some people who just always seem to know what God is saying in every situation? You know, God looks and He's looking for people who are eager to, to, to obey. People who are eager to follow, not because they want to hear what they want to hear, but because they want to hear desperately what he wants to say. And when he finds somebody like that, then he gives them his wisdom. This is what the word of God tells us. Jeremiah 29 verse 13. It says, you will seek me and find me. When you seek me, with all your heart. Yeah, yeah. We're all seeking God. Yes, we want wisdom for work. Yes, we want wisdom for our marriage relationship. Are you seeking God with all your heart? Or are you seeking him and then when you hear what he says, you say, okay, hold on. Let me look for another opinion because this doesn't fit what I wanted. Don't use circumstances to justify your own way. If you want to make, live a life of no regrets, if you want to make decisions today that you'll be proud of in the future, I hope you're beginning to realize that this is a patience thing. It's not an immediate gratification thing. It's not an instant solutions thing. God's word you don't just turn to God's word and find a solution today. You train your mind in it. And with time, you learn to hear it. We're, we're from an instant fixed generation, aren't we? We want quick solutions. Uh, Pastor, give me the five ways I can know God's will for my situation today. But what I've been teaching you is not the five ways. I've been teaching you, listen, start training. Start training. 
it's, it's not easy to train. We'd rather just look for a solution and get it right now. You know, I had of this dude. I mean, he, he, he had lost his job. He needed to get serious wisdom from God. I mean, he was depressed. And he, didn't, he hadn't been reading God's word. He had no idea where to find it. So he's like, God, I'm desperate. And he turned to the Bible. He said, I'm going to just read the first verse in the Bible. And I'll just do what it says. I must, I mean, God, I'm desperate. I need to hear from you. And he turns to the first verse in the Bible, opens to Matthew 27, verse 5. And Judas went and hung himself. And the dude is like, okay, that clearly can't be God. God doesn't talk like that. So he's okay. I just, I guess I must have opened too quickly. Let me turn a bit farther. And he turned a bit farther, and it, it was Luke chapter 10, verse 37. Go and do likewise. So by now he's thinking, okay, there's something creepy about this. And he turns to the next page and he sees Acts chapter 22 verse 16. And now what are you waiting for? <laughs> it doesn't work. God isn't into instant fixes. He's not going to help you thrive if you're not eagerly seeking him. You have to be living in a lifestyle of relationship with him. And this is what we're learning this month. You know, if you want real wisdom... Learn his word. Read it. Saturate yourself with it regularly. Every day. And you know what happens? It starts to change your mind. And you begin to know God's word. You know what? You might not even have to turn to the scripture at that point. Because the word comes unbidden to you. I've memorized that verse. This God, this, this, the, the, this is a situation at work. And, and, and things are difficult. And everybody's being fired left, right, and center. I want to panic. And then I remember the word of God. It says, you know what? Do not be anxious. Philippians 4, 6. About anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, present your request to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard my heart and mind. in Christ Jesus. I go to my prayer corner in the office. I pray. I get God's peace. And I come back. And my boss is wondering, why aren't you running around like everybody else with you? Like a chicken with their head cut off. I have the peace of God. I know what God is saying in my situation. He may not have shown me exactly what will happen, but he's told me he can give me peace right now. You're different from everybody else around you. It takes patience. It takes training. Are you ready? Mavuno Church, are you ready? No, we've said that this is our year of thriving. This thriving... Some of us will say it, others of us will do it. Because you must want it. And you must be willing to pay the cost. I started running. I, I, I remember the time I told you I was in my children's sports day. And I tried to run against these 20-year-old parents. I mean, it's disgusting how young people are nowadays when they have children. And I mean, so here I am racing with guys who are half my age in the parents' race. They should at least have a parents' race for 40-year-olds and then for 20-year-olds, you know? It doesn't make sense. I don't know why they do that. So I sprained my leg, and for the last six weeks, I've been out. And finally, I feel my leg is strong enough, and I started running again last week. Let me tell you what. It's hard. It's hard. Training is hard. <laughs> I went the first day, and I was gasping. I was wheezing. I was so out of shape. <gasps> I'm thinking, God, can I do this? And I had to think, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And the reason for me is because I want to preach the gospel when I'm old. I want to have a healthy body. I want to have a mind that will allow me to stay awake when my peers are asleep because I'm seeking God. And I'm not asleep because I'm fit. And so even though, I, <laughs> even though it cost me, two days later I was at it again. And I'm running. And guys are passing me. In fact, there's another little girl. I was so disgusted. I mean, a young 20-year-old girl, she just whizzed past me. <laughs> I was like, Surely, respect, at least cross on the other side of the road and pass me. Don't show off here. But, but you know, but, and this morning again, I was at it again and I was running. And it was hard. It wasn't pretty. I was gasping up the hill. But you know what? This heart is going to make it. I'm convinced I have to make it. Africa has to be changed. And as a result, I'm going to look after this health as long as I'm alive. It's the same thing when it comes to training to hear God's word for our decisions. You know, it's not convenient. Sometimes you wake up, you don't want to read God's word. Sometimes you, you're so preoccupied or you wake up late and you're thinking, what do I do? But you know something, when you're determined, when you know why you're doing it, when you understand that God wants me to operate at a level that I've never operated at, and I could be the one hindering his blessings right now because I'm not ready. I've been praying, God, open that door, but I'm not ready for it. I don't have the word of God in me. My, 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 my character is not in place. I'm not saturated with his wisdom. And God is waiting for me to train, to get into position for him to bless. You have to know why you're doing this. And if you don't, then you won't do it. 
And you'll watch other people thrive as they train. Remember, guys, as we've been talking, I want to conclude my sermon. Actually, let me conclude it with telling you a story. Uh, concluding with the story. Remember the Nairobi Chapel story? Can I end with that story? Because God was doing something very interesting through that closed door. It was interesting because we were so discouraged. I remember just thinking, God, how, how do you do this to us? But I remember after the initial disappointment, because there's always that disappointment where I'm like, Lord, I, I don't even feel like praying. This is so hard. And we went back to God as a leadership and we, we began to pray. Say, God, you can't have led us if you didn't know where you're taking us. You must have known what your plan was. You know what happened? As we began to pray, he began to speak. He said, good, I'm glad you're listening now. Because there's something I was doing the whole time. And he says, listen, I don't want you to just plant one big church. Because I have a big purpose for this city. And he said, what I want is for this congregation to multiply into five. As it is right now. Don't wait for another year. Do it now. I want you to multiply it into five and plant a church along every major highway of this city. And that's how Nairobi Chapel, out towards Ngong Road, K3C, Kilelesho Covenant Community Church, out in Wayaki Way, Mashariki, Mavuno Mashariki, out uh, towards Donholm, Jogo Road, uh, Mamlaka Chapel, that was exactly where Nairobi Chapel used to be, and Mavuno Church were born seven years ago. I mean, out of a closed door, God was doing something much bigger than we ever expected. If we hadn't gone back to God to ask him, what's going on, Lord? If we'd just given up and said, for sure God didn't know what he was doing, there would be no Mavuno Church today. This is the amazing thing about seeking God's wisdom. God has a plan. Not every open door is from God. Not every closed door is from God. You need to be searching and asking God, Lord, what's going on in my circumstances? Help me to understand what you're saying in your word through prayer, through godly advisors, and help it match up with my circumstances. And I believe that God wants to guide. Here's what I'm going to say as I conclude. I believe that God is seeking some amazing people in this church who is going to use beyond their own ability or imagination. We've just talked about it right now. Pastor Kuria said, God is seeking to raise people who will change this continent. I believe that our generation is going to see things that none of our parents could even have dreamt about. That, you know, we, are, we, are, we think of ourselves as Kenyans. That's about to end. Because in our time, people will start to think of themselves as Africans. And travel to Nigeria will just be an easy thing to happen. There will be people in this congregation who will start multinational businesses. Not because they want to get rich but because they're determined to change the business environment in this, this continent called Africa. And as a result, they're going to change the way business is done. There are some people God is going to use in this place to bring great change to the political space. But you know what? None of this stuff is going to happen unless we're filled with God's wisdom. We need to be people who will live life without regrets. I want to pray for us as we conclude. And you know, I sense that God wants me to pray for a couple of people here. As I prayed this morning, I said, God, show me who to pray for today. I wrote it down, so I'm going to look at my notes just now. Yep, this is what I sense God was saying. Some people here are facing a great opportunity. There's a great opportunity that's opened up before you. It's a great door. And you're very excited about it. You're so excited that you haven't prayed about it. Or sought God's will. Or asked godly advisors. You're so thrilled by this door that you've just immediately aligned your life to it. And even as I'm speaking right now, you're very scared because <laughs> it's the last thing you want to do is to give up on this thing that you've set your heart on. But I just sense that God is saying, I want you to pause. Pause on that opportunity. Seek my mind first. Read my word. <laughs> and if you've not been reading God's word, maybe the first place to start is godly advisors. That's the easiest one. But I want you to start training to hear me even as you face this opportunity. I want to pray for you because I want to believe that this opportunity could be of God. Maybe it's not, but God will give you wisdom if you're seeking Him with all your heart. I also sense that God said there's some people in this place who've clearly heard God, but you found reason not to obey. You're praying about it. And God is saying it's time to stop praying. It's time to start obeying. There's some situation in your life when God has clearly told you what to do. It's a relationship. It's an office situation. You know what it is. And God is saying, listen, listen, listen. I, I don't even want the prayer now. I want obedience. 
do what I told you to do. Stop praying about it. Uh, uh, you know what I want you to do. So if you're here, you know God is saying, I want you to respond to me. Just stand up if this is you. I want to pray for you. This is a place of surrender where you're saying, God, not my will, but yours be done. I'm going to seek you in this opportunity, in this situation, and trust you as opposed to trusting myself. Thank you for all who are standing. Praise God. Lord, you're so amazing. You always speak, and you always know exactly what you're doing. I bless you for all those who are standing. To God be the glory. I'm going to ask you to stretch out your hands right now in surrender. And just say, Lord, I surrender this situation. I surrender this opportunity. I give it to you, Lord. You show me what to do. If you are a person who has not obeyed, Lord, I commit that I will obey you. I know what it is you're saying that I should do. And Lord, I've been finding every excuse like Gideon not to obey. But Lord, right now I surrender to you and I will obey. Praise God. Lord, listen to all these prayers as they come up to you. These are your children. And Lord, you know exactly the situation they're in. Thank you because there are some disobedient people who will be disobedient no more. Because from today, obedience will happen. And that Lord Jesus, as a result, they will begin to hear your word. Because Lord, you speak to those who want to hear it and who will obey it. And so I bless you. Because today you are delivering somebody from a life of regrets. With a decision that they are making in this place. We honor you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for those who are yielding up their opportunities to you right now. We bless you because you're the one who made us. You know the opportunities that fit us, that you have created for us. But Lord, we also thank you because you are able to protect us from the evil one who will distract us with opportunities that are not of you. I speak, Lord, that as these opportunities are yielded to you now, that Lord, you would put godly advice in the lives of those who are standing. You'd give them wisdom and humility to seek others who can speak into this situation. And Lord, I pray that you'd give them a determination to seek God's will and to obey you, even if it means letting go of this opportunity. And Father, I know you will be glorified in their lives as they take this step. We bless you, Lord. We thank you because you're here. Lord, I just want to honor you. I honor you because in their lives you'll be glorified. I honor you because as they surrender, you'll be glorified. I honor you because here are destinies that are being shaped right now, taken back from the devil who destroys. I thank you because there's something happening in the spiritual realm, even as we pray this prayer. And Lord, you're snatching somebody from death and translating them into life. We honor you, Lord. For we pray all this thing in the name of Jesus. God's people say it. Amen. Come on, let's appreciate all those who've just made that prayer. To God be the glory. Woo! Uh, just before we go, you know what? I want to pray for somebody who hasn't given their life to Christ. You've heard me make this call. By the way, I've done this almost every Sunday through this series. But I really sense that God wants to call some of his children, his sons and daughters to him. He's been watching you for a long time. He wants you to give your life to him. You will never make wise decisions if you don't have the counselor with you, the Holy Spirit. And when you ask Christ to come into your life, he becomes your counselor. You, the Holy Spirit becomes your counselor and gives you wisdom to translate all these tools and to use them. And maybe you're here and now you know why you need God in your life. For the first time, you're like, you know what? I never understood this thing. But now I understand why I need to surrender and, 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 and believe God and trust Him to come and to lead me in my life. I've been making decisions by myself, but I want Him to come in. I'm going to ask you if you're here, just raise your hand right now. We're going to pray for you. I suspect there might be some who've come, and you know what? You even knew you're coming, and today might be that day. Just raise it up. We're going to pray for you. I thank God for you if you're here. And I'm just going to pray for you as we conclude. Anybody who's here? Anybody who's here, I was just going to say, Pastor, pray for me. By the way, don't even look at the people next to you. It has nothing to do with them. But your destiny cannot be tied to theirs. I thank God for that person at the back whose hand is raised, that brother at the back whose hand is raised. To God be the glory for you. I thank God for you, my brother. Anybody else who's going to join him, just say, you know what? From today, I untie my destiny from him who would pull me back. I'm yoking myself to God. I want to live a life of wisdom and not a life of self-direction. Anybody else who's here, I'm going to pray for you. And then we're going to conclude. Anybody who wants to pray as I pray for my brother, to God be the glory. Well, thank God for you, my brother. And you know what? There might be somebody else here who needs to pray that prayer. You haven't had the courage to put up your hand. I challenge you. I dare you. Stay behind. Talk to one of our pastors. Don't leave without making this commitment. I believe that God is seeking some people who he wants to use. And you're one of them. And don't run off before you get this prayer. If you have questions, just ask them. Nobody's going to force you to pray it. So come and talk to one of us. I'm going to pray for my brother right now. I'm going to ask you, my brother, to pray this prayer. And I'm going to ask us to pray it with him. Dear Jesus, I come to you. I give you my life. From this day forward, come in, Lord. 
May your Holy Spirit direct me. May you give me all wisdom that I will follow you all the days of my life. Help me to thrive. Help me to live a life without regrets. For this I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's appreciate my brother. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. To God be the glory. Come on, let's stand up as we conclude our service. Our God is good, isn't he? He's amazing. He's amazing. He's amazing. How many people know they are going to thrive this year? It's thrive or thrive. You know what? It's halfway through the year and we're still thriving. To God be the glory. And you know what? Our thriving has nothing to do with our circumstances. Some of you are thriving despite your circumstances. I glorify God for you. Next week, we start an amazing series. We're going to be talking about some incredible things that God is looking for, some amazing heroes that God is searching for. Make sure you're here. Bring your friends who need to be here. I'm going to bless you as you go out into the week. Raise your hands and receive God's blessing. Father, I thank you for your children. Lord, I thank you for every single person who is in this church. I thank you that none of us is here by coincidence. Lord, it's such a place of humility that we're in. That you've called us out of darkness. We, not other people, but us. And that, Lord, you're translating us into light. That, Lord, you're raising up some astute decision makers in this place. That, Lord, you're setting us on a course where we'll not live a life of regrets because we have your wisdom guiding us. And so, Lord, I release your spirit of wisdom to direct your children this week. I pray that, Father God, the spirit who is in them would arise. That, Lord, you would warn them where there's trouble. That, Lord, you'd lead them into wisdom. I pray that, Father, as they continue into this habit of reading your word, that, Lord, they would find joy in it. Lord, sometimes your reading your word is hard, <laughs> unless your spirit helps us. And so I pray that, Lord, you'd release your spirit, that every time we read your word, we'd, we'd hear something that would direct us in our day. Lord, I pray that that connection with you, that friendship would happen. And that, Lord, you'd even remind us to pray as we're driving, as we're in that matatu, in whatever we're doing, we'd have conversation with you, we'd stay connected. And then, Lord, I just pray for godly advisors to be in the lives of these. I pray that, Lord, even as they walk along this journey, that, Lord, you'd open doors for them and shut doors that shouldn't be in their path. And, Lord, when they find those doors, they'd know exactly what to do because they have your wisdom. And so I speak blessing over your children in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God's people say it. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen.